This week's Technique Tuesday video is an introduction to short rows. In this video, I will explain what short rows are, what they're used for, and give some examples of the way short rows are commonly used in projects. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. A short row literally means that as you are working across a row of live stitches, you stop short of finishing the row, and then you turn and you work back in the other direction. I could turn and I could either work all the way to the end of the row or I could work again only some of these stitches and then turn again. So short rows are usually done in a series of, there's usually a series of short rows in the section. Those short rows might get shorter and shorter or they might get longer and longer. It depends on the situation. So what I'm going to do here is just briefly demonstrate a series of short rows that get shorter and shorter. And I'm going to show you the chart that I'm going to use. So this chart has 30 stitches on it and these arrows represent that I've worked across this direction and I've worked back across that direction. It could be any number of rows that I've worked. And now I'm going to start the short rows. So in this case, I'm going to work until I get to, till I've worked 25 stitches. So there'll be five stitches remaining. Then I'm going to turn and I'm going to work back again in the other direction until there are five stitches remaining. And I'm going to keep working back and forth like this, five stitches uh, short of where I'd worked the previous time. Okay, so I have five stitches left. I'm just going to turn and I'm going to work back in the other direction. I'm not doing anything except turning and working back in the other direction. And again, I'm going to stop when I have five stitches remaining. Okay, I have five stitches remaining and now I'm going to turn again. And this time you have a little gap here where I had uh, turned previously. This time I'm going to stop five stitches short of that turn. So there's going to be 10 stitches remaining on the needle when I turn this time. So again, you can see I have that little gap there. I've got five stitches here and five stitches here. I'm going to turn one more time. And once again, I'm going to turn when I have five stitches up before the previous turn where that gap is. So you can see I have five, five with that gap in the middle. So if we look at my chart, this is the point where I am right now. So now when I turn, I'm going to knit all the way across to the end. So I'm going to turn I'm going to knit across all of those stitches. Okay, now I'm going to work across all of the stitches. So I have now worked across all of the stitches. I'm back at this point. Here, I could just continue working however long I wanted to work, or I could do a bind off. I could bind off at this stage. So that's what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to bind this off and then we're gonna take a look at what this swatch looks like. So let's take a close up look at this swatch. So garter stitch, you get these ridges that are formed by working two rows. So when we did that first turn, we came all the way over to here and we turned and we went back in the opposite direction. You can see that this row right here just stops. It just stops right here and you have the long row above it and the long row below it. 
that kind of um, come together uh, at where this ridge stops. So you can see where those ridges were because this is a very horizontal stitch pattern. Um, but otherwise, um, it, and, and if you pull it apart, you can see that there's a little um, bit of, of a hole there. So the, the hole is because you have these two long rows that have to separate and make room uh, for this row right here. So that causes them to spread apart. And so at the base of that, you get this hole. It's the same as, as how you can get a little pinhole at the base of a new column of stitches when you do an increase. You don't want something huge, but a small pinhole is acceptable because you have to make room for the new column of stitches, just like you have to make room for this new ridge of stitches here. So what is the purpose of short rows? What would be the reason for doing something like that? Well, when you work short rows, you get more length across those columns of stitches that you worked every row, and you get less length over the ones that you only worked some of the time, and you get the least amount of length over the ones that you um, were never included in the short row that were always uh, left to the side. So the purpose of short rows is to add length to some of the columns of stitches without adding length to the others. It's a way of shaping fabric vertically, just as you use increases and decreases to shape fabric horizontally in order to make it narrower in some places and wider in others. These are three little swatches that were worked very much the same way that I, I worked the blue one that I showed you. The difference in this garter stitch one is I worked an additional a ridge of garter stitch before I did the bind off. So it's, it's a little wider. I repeated the process in seed stitch. So in, in garter stitch, because the ridges are so horizontal, you can see where one of them stops and turns in the other direction. So you can see where those ridges uh, change. But in, if you look closely, you might see that there is a little hole at that location, but the row gauge of garter stitch is very compressed, so the holes aren't really terribly noticeable. Now in seed stitch, you really can't see the holes at all, and it might differ from person to person whether you can see a hole, but it's also not a horizontal stitch pattern, so you don't get that obvious uh, appearance of where the turn was. You really can't see it in seed stitch. But if you repeat that experiment in stockinette stitch, as I've done here, what you'll notice is that first of all, the row gauge is not as compressed. And so the rows are further apart. And that means any hole that you do find here is going to probably be a little bigger. But actually, if you look at this, the holes aren't that noticeable, but what's noticeable is the bumpy surface. And that comes from the way stockinette behaves at the selvages. So anytime you work across stockinette, you work your knit row and then you turn and you work across the purl row, you'll always see that the selvages look different. You'll see one stitch that looks normal and then you'll have one that's twisted that kind of creates this little bump at the edge. And that's what happens when you work in stockinette and you just turn and you work and go back in the other direction. So in order to avoid this kind of bumpy look, particularly in stockinette fabric, typically what you do is you use what's called a short row technique at the turn. Um, and then when you are back to working the longer rows again and going past that original turning point, you do something special again in order to eliminate that bump. So then you end up with something that looks like this. Like if you look carefully, I mean, you, it's obvious that this is longer than this and you can kind of see that the fabric is waving, but you can't see that bumpy look before. And this piece of fabric used a technique called German short rows, but you get the same result if you use other short row techniques. There are many, many different short row techniques. This one used one that's called wrap and turn short rows. And again, you get that same smooth fabric appearance without the bumps. So what I'm going to do is go through that same exercise that I went through before, but this time I'm going to use a short row technique at the turning point.
So I have five stitches remaining and now it's time to apply the short row technique. And if you want to practice uh, short row techniques and different types of short row techniques, use this same system uh, always leaving five stitches at the end when you make your turn and you apply your technique. So sometimes the short row technique is going to get applied to the stitch across from where you're turning and sometimes it's going to get applied to the stitch that is the turning stitch. It doesn't matter, you're still going to turn in the same place. So in my case, for German short rows, you turn and you bring the yarn to the front if it's not already there. And then you slip this stitch and you bring the yarn over. So if you hold the yarn in your left hand, it's really easy to do that. You just bring it over and you're going to pull up and to create this, what's called a double stitch. You can see it on there. If you hold the yarn in your right hand, you can still do it. It might be a little, a little bit trickier to do that, um, but you can still do it. And then you would bring the yarn back to the front in order to work those purl stitches. So the point is that the yarn is in front. If it's not there already, you slip that stitch and then you pull it over the needle in order to create a double stitch. It's going to create this two-legged stitch. And now you bring the yarn where it needs to be in order to work the next stitch. And in this case, I'm working a purl row, so I need to bring it to the front again. And then I purl across until once again, I have five stitches remaining. Okay, I have five stitches remaining. I'm going to turn my work. I need to bring the yarn to the front. If it's not already there, which it isn't, I need to bring the yarn to the front. And then I need to slip this stitch and I need to bring the yarn over the needle in order to create that double stitch right here. So you wanna be able to see that double stitch on the needle and then you work the stitches. So now I'm going to work until I'm 10 stitches from the edge or from the end. And in my case, because that double stitch was created in that turning stitch, 10 stitches from the end is four stitches before this double stitch. Now it's time to turn. Yarn has to be in front slip that stitch and pull the yarn over to create my double stitch. Put, I'm going to put my finger on here to keep it like that and now bring it to the front and now I can purl. So again, I need to be four stitches before the double stitch because we've got five when we got the double stitch and I need to be 10 from the end. So that is my 10th one. Turn. So this is my last turn, but I still need to create my short row technique. I need to apply my short row technique at this turn. So once again, slip and pull over to create the double stitch. If we look at our little chart, now, we, now that we've turned, we're going to work all the way across the stitches. And that means we're going to encounter these double stitches. And I have a double stitch. I'm going to work that like it was one stitch. So it's kind of like a knit two together. Um, but it's just treated as one stitch. So I enter, I put my needle through both of them, i work that double stitch, and then I continue on. Now I have another double stitch, I'm going to work that. And then I have the last five stitches to work. So different short row techniques uh, are worked a little differently at the turn and as you come back across them later. So, uh, but if you use the same uh, chart and you always stop here and then apply your technique to whichever stitch it needs to be applied to, um, and then when you return, do it however it needs to be worked, it will work out fine. So I have the final row to work. So I'm gonna be working across all of the, these regular stitches here, and then I'll have these two double stitches to work on the purl side. So when I get to my double stitch here, I'm gonna treat this again as one stitch. I'm just going to purl, uh, purl them together, purl like it was a purl two together. So now I've worked across all of those uh, stitches and uh, I'm going to work two more rows and then bind them off. 
So I'm going to show you some pretty common uses for short rows and you'll start to see the variety of uses. So in this first case, I used uh, short row shaping at the shoulders. When you knit a sweater that has set in sleeves like this, the shoulders are typically angled and that's because your shoulder where it meets the arm is lower on your body than it is by your neck. And so you can create this shaping so that it fits your body better. So it's, it's this kind of shaping that would look like this, only you can do it across the shoulder. And what you, the advantage of that is that you can keep all of the stitches live until you've done your shaping. And then you can do it on the back as well. And then when it's time to join the shoulders, you can use what's called a three needle bind off, which allows you to join and do the seam at the same time. So you don't have to bind it off and then seam, you are joining with all of the live stitches where if you did a different type of shaping where you bound off some of the stitches and then the next time you bound off a few more and then bound off a few more, you'd get what are called stair steps. And so you'd have to bind those off and then you'd have to seam two stair step edges together. And it can be done and it can be done neatly, but it's just uh, not as nice a finish as you can get if you do short rows and then a three needle bind off. So this is a little kind of scarf shawl thing. And the, and the way the short rows were used in this is that first, this edge, this strip right here, that was all knit in one very long strip. And then stitches were picked up along the edge here, along the entire length of the the little scarf and you can see how narrow the stockinette portion is right here compared to um, in the center. And so in this case, after the stitches were picked up, purl across into about this much of the center and then worked back and forth in gradually longer and longer short rows. So that this section right here got the most rows and only the, the last stitches here only got a couple of rows here and that allowed me to create this kind of crescent shaped scarf. This is a sweater with a shawl collar and the way short rows were used for this is that stitches were picked up along the vertical edge of the front all along the v-neck across the back of the neck all down this part of the v-neck and all the way down of the front side um, of the, the other vertical edge. And so you had all of your stitches on the needle. And then what you do is you work back until you up here at the neck. So you work across the back of the neck and then you work back and forth, establishing the shortest short row and then working back and forth a few stitches more each time creating longer and longer short rows uh, all the, until you've gone all the way down and you're going back and forth, back and forth. You're filling in that V-neck. And once you hit the base of the V-neck from doing your short rows, then you can just work back and forth across all of the stitches in order to create the button band and the buttonhole band. So this is a very common way of doing a shawl collar these days. Socks are another very common situation in which short rows are used. And I've got two examples of socks with different types of heels that are worked. So for the leg, you're working in the round in a tube. And then when you get, this is worked cuff down, when you get to the heel, you're using half the stitches, which I'm showing here in pink. So you're working this pink flap, a little rectangle, a flap, and then you need to switch from working a leg to working a foot. You have to turn the corner. When you're ready to turn this heel, which I'm showing here in the purple, you work across from the beginning of the heel to just past the center and then just past the center in that other way. So you have this little short row that you start with. But this time, as you're working back and forth, you also decrease. Every, every time you come to the point where you're gonna turn, you work a decrease. So this reduces the number of stitches at the same time that you're creating more length across the center and less length here. And that allows you to actually just turn the corner of this heel. 
And then once the heel is turned and you have only these purple stitches live here and these blue stitches live here that you've let rest while you were working the heel, then you pick up stitches along the side of the heel. You work across all of the live stitches there, pick up stitches here, and now you've got a whole round again of live stitches and then you can work decreases to bring the stitch count down to what it was for the leg. So that's one way of using short rows. You're using, you're combining short rows, which is a vertical shaping technique with decreases, which is a horizontal shaping technique. This type of heel is, is called a short row heel, and that's because the entire heel is worked with short rows. In this case, and you can work this in either direction, but in this case, you again, you start with half of the stitches and you're working back and forth in increasingly shorter short rows. So you start out with the long short rows and you work shorter and shorter and shorter short rows until you have just a few stitches left that have gotten all of these rows here. And then you start working in longer and longer short rows and that creates this kind of cup right here. And you need that because the front of your leg and foot is shorter than the back of your leg. Your leg has to go all the way to the floor before it can turn the corner where the top of your leg and foot uh, has a, a shorter distance to travel. So the purpose of these short rows here is to add this extra room, this extra space in the sock tube uh, to allow your foot uh, room in order to turn that corner. In this video, I demonstrated how short rows are used with and without a short row technique applied at the turn. The technique I demonstrated in the stockinette swatch was German short rows, which happens to be my favorite method, but like everything in knitting, there are always multiple ways of getting to the same end point. Experiment with different methods and see which techniques are your favorites. You can try new short row techniques on a swatch like the ones I knit in today's video. I'll be doing a short rows Q&A live stream on May 1st at 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time. I'll show other examples of how short rows can be used as well as answer questions from viewers. The live stream will be recorded and I'll add it to my playlist of short row techniques already on my channel. So if you can't see it live, you will still be able to see it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.